Welcome back to Call Me By Your Game, the podcast where I, your host, Connor McCabe, bring on a guest to hear from them about a meaningful or memorable video game from a particular moment in their life. On the show, you'll know we talk to our guest as much about what made playing that game special and what sticks out to them to this day as we will get into the context of how and when they had this memorable time with it. A little bit of housekeeping up top is that um, anything that my guest or I plug today on the podcast, there are going to be links in the show notes for you to click and follow and and just uh, support us however in the ma- mountain of ways that you can. So whether you're watching on YouTube or listening in your favorite podcast catcher, if you scroll down in the episode description, there's going to be great links and stuff for you there. Whether you want to check out all of our social media for Call Me By Your Game, whether you are interested in hopping in the Discord we have for our podcast network or even supporting us on Patreon, there's links in the show notes. Uh, So go ahead and scroll down and you'll find it. Um, Before I introduce my guest, folks, today we have... uh, I I just got self-conscious about calling it a monumental episode, (laughs) but I'm going to double down and just say we have a monumental episode of the podcast coming to you today. If you're a longtime listener of the show, or really a recent listener, because it comes up a lot, I've been threatening the audience for years at this point to bring people back to do their own solo episodes. People have returned to the show, whether it be for the co-op panel series, whether it be to be in a group and list their top 10 favorite games of all time, even our, I think our baseball series that's recurred, we've had people return. But this is the first time that we're bringing back a past guest to list another memorable game from a moment in their life. Uh, And folks, it's one of our first guests that we ever had on the show. I'm really excited. So please welcome to the microphone actor and writer, Heather Woodward. Hello. Yeah, I am very available. So I am (laughs) here to do your podcast, whatever you like. Uh, I uh, music to my ears, uh, and I'm also I'm just we're equally two very available people to do stuff like this. Uh, I love it, Heather. I'm so excited to have you back on the podcast. Uh, I did a little. Um, I don't always do a good job when I have people return to the show because I I'm always like, wait, you were kind of on this episode. When was it? No, I know exactly when it was. It was episode 12. You came on. To discuss 12. Super Mario RPG uh, in, and I'm pretty sure we recorded this like early on in 2020 as well. So it's just, it's been a while, but here you are. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, Mario RPG was the first one, which was, still remains a real landmark game for me. Um, uh, and then also I was back once to talk about Zelda music. At yes, Nazi. oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you came on. I, I think I'm very available. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've that, that if we walk away with one thing, knowing one thing about you today, it's that you're available. Um, I'm available. And I'm down for podcasts. Anyone? Uh, you're the, just going to start to get inquiries in your inbox like crazy. <laughs> uh, maybe to a degree you don't want, but we'll see. Um, yeah, that, I should maybe tap that down. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll see. You know, you do what you want. Um, <laughs> That that was such a different, I mean, a different time in the show. I was even telling you before the podcast that the format for this version of the show, the classic version as I'm calling it, hasn't, <laughs> truly has not changed outside of the fact that when I go back and listen to those old episodes, I, I, I cringe not at the content, but at how like clearly new I am at hosting <laughs> a show. I'm, I'm a little, I'm less, I mean, the insecurities still come up anyway, but I'm less confident even the way I brought this up recently, the way I like introduce the show, I say the word your differently. I would always say, call me by your game, like, oh. which is just something it's, I mean, who cares? People pronounce things differently, but it's something yeah. I noticed. Um, and then one other thing that was different was back at, you know, these early days of recording before the pandemic hit in 2020, I would uh, do a little segment before we recorded the podcast where we play the game for a half hour. Do you remember doing this? Oh, yes. That I mean, I hadn't remembered, but I, I do now. Kind of coming back. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there is still a video of you on our YouTube channel of me and you sitting together in a, a, a tiny closet and watching you just play the first 30 minutes of Super Mario RPG. <laughs> uh, which has since been re-released. Yes, yeah. Uh, did you happen to pick up the the remake? Of I have the, not yet. Game? Um. Is something that I got for I had actually played it for the finally for the first time all the way through earlier like 
that February or so. Oh, right before the new port? Yes. And, and this was, I think, before they even had announced it. So I kind of felt like partially responsible, like, oh, now that I played it, now they're releasing the new version of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the interest is out there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take credit for it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So while I didn't, I didn't buy it upon release because I had just played it. I did receive it for Christmas, but it's still shrink-wrapped over on this, like, stack of Switch games you can kind of see right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a I have a long playlist of games I'm trying to get through, so I... So, repeat games are sadly uh, down the list right now. For yeah, me. totally. New experiences. Um, I mean, before we talk, even get into... A little bit of, you know, the game we're going to talk about and and your, you know, a, a, new, a twist on the history with gaming segment. Um, it's been a few years. It's been four years since you've been on the regular, the classic version of the show. What do you want to share uh, about yourself with the listener? Uh, who are you? That's true. Hi. Uh, everything has changed since last time I was here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm riddled with COVID. No. Um, uh yeah, I'm an actor and a writer, and I and and still do a variety of comedy shows. And and uh, I used to only write uh, sort of internet and TV stuff. Uh, and since last time I was here, uh, I transitioned to game writing, and so now I write on a little game called Apex Legends. Pretty cool uh, stuff. Yeah, and I've been there for a couple of years. Yeah, that's – I remember when you first uh, had like – and, you know, full disclosure, we we had lunch and talked about games mm-hmm. writing last year. So we've got – it's not like this is the first time we've gotten to chat about it. You're telling um, the secrets? Yeah, wow. the, the secrets are out. I, I occasionally get lunch with uh, old friends in, in <laughs> Oh, wow. Friends see each other outside of recording each other in Hollywood? Yeah, just once every three years, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's it's been so exciting to see, you know, have this new journey pop up for you as someone who is, you know, such a talented writer and storyteller and also someone who has a passion for games. Like, it's been a great example of how those two things can sort of meet. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's really fun. I I had an idea of what to expect before I came in, uh, but there's always things that surprise me about the job and yes and also game dev life is building a car while you're driving it so (laughs) it's just it it every time you think you have a handle on something then something else pops up and you go huh i didn't see that coming uh and and for anyone who doesn't know uh apex uh it's a it's a live service game so it means we just get to keep working on it until somebody tells us to stop um, and it's also a battle royale game, so it's not narrative driven, but it has a rich narrative that we tell in all sorts of ways. Um, so because of that, it's it's like uh, it's really fun and different to to write on something like this. You really have to look at every single corner of storytelling to do it. I bet um, that makes that makes so much sense. I do. I I've thought about this since we met and talked, but. I do still find it so cool, kind of cool and interesting that you, you know, like a narrative writer, ended up working on a game that sort of has a living writer's room, like we might mm-hmm. hope to have working on a TV show. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's special. It's really, it's a cool thing that when I started to look into transitioning into game writing, I... I was thinking narrative games. I mean, Red Dead Redemption is really the thing that did it for me. I mean, there's oh, plenty wow. of narrative-driven games, Red Dead 2 specifically, but uh, there's plenty of games that had, their storytelling had moved me over the years, but Red Dead was the first time I went, huh, I was somebody writes it. I bet they don't just come to be. It's, <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, it feels dumb to say I neglected to realize anybody writes games. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like, I feel like the equivalent for comedians is like when you're growing up, you're like, I wish I could be on SNL. I guess just actors sometimes end up on SNL. And then as you get older, you're like, oh no, there's an actual pipeline Yes, and like specific training and stuff. Um, so same with game writing. I just like didn't clock for a long time that Mm -hmm. some of these games have writer's rooms. And for a long time, they didn't. They a long time. It was just, uh, the designers designing levels and then piecing together the narrative yeah the narrative was 
bottom of the concerns and and they just like strung it together and now obviously uh games have gotten so rich and so uh cinematic yeah absolutely it's really cool it's a cool time and uh and every time i hear a little bit about your journey it's really i'm really excited for you uh thanks and it's you know it's it's been funny to not to talk about this not not to talk about this too long but uh, this may have been something we discussed, but how many people that we both, I think, re- have realized that we knew who worked in games that we knew from comedy? Like, yeah. I've been very surprised, whether it was you or other friends, uh, that they've already been, kind of been in that space working. And I think that also helps sort of demystify it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I love, You had an amazing example earlier about being like a kid who likes comedy and <laughs> wondering how SNL – even, how people even get on that but it was kind of a similar thing i think to be like oh yeah. heather does this my friend alec does this so and so does this like it's out there um but that's really cool uh yeah. good for you dude you know what um years ago i was writing on a show and uh this this fabulous writing team uh that was in the writer's room was uh, uh in between uh writer's rooms they worked on they worked on some games i won't say what Mm -hmm. uh but they were they were i think at the time they had just said mobile games and i was like oh okay there's yeah i'm sure there's a thriving industry of that for for writing gigs um but it it i learned after the fact it was actually like a little bigger than that but (laughs) they uh they offered to recommend me to their boss to, to for side gig work uh, in mm. between in between uh, uh, writers rooms and I sent a couple of scripts with their recommendations and they they forwarded it along and then they said oh sorry they don't think you they don't think your samples are very strong oh, no. <laughs> that is not the way I expected that so to I go. did not get it and at the time <laughs> I wasn't looking for game jobs so mm-hmm. I was just like oh, all right same to you pal yeah. but uh, I'm happy to say, uh, you know, sometimes you just got to wait for the right one because my current situation is much better than that one yes. was and would be. Yeah. Wow. Uh, gosh, that it I, don't, I know you weren't trying to do a bait and switch, but it was really effective because I thought you were <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm misremembering your story and how you got into Apex. And this is the story. Nope, not at all. Nope. Um, that's so funny. And yeah, I only I just remembered that now in real time too which is oh, why no i was way. a little rambly on it but i yeah i totally forgot that like apex was not the first time i applied to a game a game Interesting, job yeah <laughs> it's just the first time i tried when i was trying to get a game job yeah as opposed oh. to just a side gig gosh that's so funny i mean <laughs> through all this too if, if i hadn't made it clear too and if you haven't listened to the first episode or the other episodes heather's been on we know each other through the ucb improv world which is how i know that I, I don't know i always say like 97 percent of the guests who end up coming on <laughs> yeah. here um truly is the majority um and then uh, I've, I've talked about it a bit on the show how i've gotten into games writing over the last year and, and you were one of a couple people who helped at least just like uh you lent me your ear so i could ask you questions about it and it was really helpful and motivating i mean i don't know if i've talked about it on this show but i also ended up taking uh, the the same a UCLA extension course that you did mm-hmm. um, with a great instructor. And that coupled with like doing game jams has helped me sort of kick off this journey too. So um, just for t- I'm kind of like tying a couple threads together that have been like loose ends on this show. Um, but so excited to have you on for so many reasons. Um, before we get into your, uh, you know, recent history with games, will you do me a favor Mm -hmm. uh, and introduce what you've brought on for today's main event later and call me by your game? Yes, I have brought on the 90s classic Myst, the uh, point-and-click 3D world that broke all of us of a certain (laughs) age's brain. (laughs) Yes. Uh, This is a... uh, I said earlier it was a momentous episode because... Uh, you are the first person to ever come back for a solo return, but it's also exciting because very I always I often try to steer new guests towards like I usually ask them to give me a few options so I can steer mm-hmm. them towards one we haven't done. We've this will be the third time we've repeated a game, but it's been years. We've had um 
you're a big Zelda fan. We've had Ocarina mm-hmm. of Time has been talked about twice. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, oh, no, this is the fourth, actually, I'm realizing. Uh, Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's nice. Conquest. Nice. Um, uh, Tony Hawk's Underground. Ooh. And then now Mist. Uh, so I'm really excited. A lot of just fun. I feel like I'm, this is, what is this? It feels like the last episode of the show or something like that. <laughs> um, but I'm pumped to talk about Mist. I, I would love to save most of that conversation for the main event after the break. But um, getting into, you know, your recent history with games, Heather, uh, I know that it's been four years since we've been on. There's a lot of change that's happened for you. Um, what would you say, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, okay. has been like the biggest gaming surprise for you over the last four years like has there been an experience you're like i don't know if i'm gonna like that and you had in terms of something i've played sure but if if you don't have an answer and expanse of something else go for it okay okay um uh okay keeping uh, i'm gonna keep on on the game track cool um this is pandering a bit uh (laughs) to to my own lovely employers but um my I, uh, Apex is owned by uh, is made by Respawn, uh, who yes. else makes uh, made Jedi Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor. And I don't want to spoil anything if anyone hasn't played either of the games. Uh, I can't I can't recommend them enough. I mean, I played uh, Fallen Order before I was involved with Respawn and mm. loved it. Then um, I really loved Survivor, uh, and there there's a fight. I'm gonna I'm gonna be clunky and coded about it sure. just in case it's a spoiler for anyone. Um, there's a fight with a character that you don't see coming uh, that uh, the way they transitioned you out of the fight took my breath away. Wow, <laughs> I, yeah. I didn't see it coming. They totally got me. The The character turn uh, I I was very satisfying. I had a hint about it and then forgot about it. So then it surprised me again when it came back. And then, uh, the way that sequence ends, the way that feature ends, I, um, I really was like, Oh my God, what are they doing? (laughs) Yes. I'm, I'm kind of remembering now when we got together for lunch last at the end of last summer, I think it was, uh, I was finishing up, this is a this is a roundabout way to get back to talking about the Jedi series. Uh-huh. I was finishing up Tears of the Kingdom. Survivor, I think, came out two weeks before, and I was like, if I don't finish this now, I'm never gonna play it because of Tears. Mm-hmm. Having loved Fallen Order. Um and I think you were either playing it or were about to get to it when we had that lunch or so. Yes. Oh, you're so right. So I I went through the same thing where uh but poor, poor Jedi Survivor, like the timing, they just got boned on how Truly. close it came out to, uh, <laughs> not that the game has suffered greatly or anything. It's done fabulously. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the timing up to one of the most anticipated sequels of all time, mm-hmm. this Tears of the Kingdom coming out, like they came out within a month of each other. Um, so I, like you, was like, I gotta play Survivor now. Uh, <laughs> so I played it as hard and as fast as I could, but still trying to savor it and not just like, like you know, run through it, mm-hmm. speed run through it. And um, uh, I didn't get to the end, and I was like, ugh, I'm so sorry. I love Star Wars so much, but I I run the risk of Zelda stuff being spoiled for me, and I've been yeah. absolutely bonkers waiting for this game. I got to put Survivor on hold. And I did. And then I was deep in Zelda for a long time. And then it took a bit for me to get back to Survivor. But then when I did, it was so worth it. Yes. Was there, do you remember there being any uh, challenge in getting back, back up to speed combat wise in Survivor? Because the combat is so challenging. I mean, in a Mm -hmm. great way, I think. But did you experience that at all from what you remember? Uh, A little bit. Uh, I forgot a lot of the um the like skill tree tricks you oh, acquire yes. like the stuff that gets pretty specific in terms of how you play it um but a lot of uh a lot of the physical play is like not very different from how apex plays and so some of it is like once a respawn game always a respawn game okay um 
So, because I play Apex constantly. Um, so, in a way, I was, like, still kind of up to speed on the on the gameplay. Really, it's just going from Nintendo to PlayStation that's clunky. Oh, yeah, sure. It's just, I'm always like, oh, no, A is not the same as X. I hate this. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, too, you know, loved those games and Survivor. I, I ended up liking... Even more than Fallen Order, mm-hmm. uh, and we've done, you know, I don't think I've even, I think I mentioned it already, but you were a guest on the first ever co-op episode, so another reason why this is special, mm-hmm. uh, you being back on, but I've done in the last couple of years, so this, the one we're going to do next month will be episode 48, literally four years of them, which is crazy, mm-hmm. but cool. I did... When I played Fallen Order, I was like, I have to do an episode on this. I have to talk to somebody about this game. And then a couple months later, uh, did like, well, a couple months after Survivor came out, we also did one. So I can, I if you're ever looking for Jedi podcasts, I'll send them to you. Please um, do. Because they, they'll come out for free eventually. They just haven't yet. So um, that's so cool to hear that you uh, love them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, respawn. Also just, then, so I yes. played through the end and I was like, oh, nailed it. Great job, y'all. And then uh, after I put it down, I started playing some uh, some other stuff. I was talking to one of the Star Wars devs uh, who, who is on a different team now at Respawn, but uh, they were like, oh, well, did you play the, uh, did you play the, the after finale content? It's like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and it's, it's not huge. Yeah. Like, it's not huge story beats or anything, but they filled out a lot of the world uh after after you finish oh, the main I story. See. So like, you know how you get force echoes around that give you bits and pieces of story? Yeah. Uh you get a whole bunch of new ones because the stuff you didn't know before the ending, you then get to see the force echoes for. So you get to see all of the breadcrumbs that lead you up to the end. That is so cool. If I don't re you know reinstall it i might have to go watch a youtube video to see this because i did not know that yeah it's really fun and like i if nobody's gonna know who this is if this isn't really a spoiler because you don't know who she is for most of the game but yeah but the little girl kata Mm -hmm. uh she's on the ship for like forever after you play after you finish the story and she's got little little fun bits of dialogue that is like you know it's not it's not going to change the story in a big way it just makes it feel so lived in in such a nice way yeah oh what a what a game uh, i i'm remembering too the the story moment sorry to get back to this you know five minutes after you brought it up but <laughs> the story moment you're talking about with the fight i mm-hmm. also i think we had a very similar experience where i know i think some other people saw it coming mm-hmm. earlier in the game i was more suspicious and i kind of like forgot about it and that may be good just narrative like them getting us off the scent because when it came back i was also i thought the game was over yeah yeah um yeah it felt it felt like it had a few endings which like you may or may not like but it 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 means the surprises kept coming yes yeah oh so good so satisfying i'm gonna be i'm so excited still you know or already to see where they go with with the next one. Yeah. Um, my Snoopy ass looking for like games writing jobs of uh, these ones not qualified for at all. But, uh, you know, see job listings um, uh, f- for that or have seen. And I'm always like, oh, man, I can't wait to see what they do. It's going to be <laughs> exciting. Um, uh, that's fantastic. Um, it, what have you been playing recently? Ooh, I I'm. I feel like I should preface this by saying I'm cheap, and so I never play anything in real time unless I'm, like, really worried about the Tears of the Kingdom spoiler yes. problem. Um, I didn't want anyone to tell me a single detail about Zelda before I got in there. Mm. Um, but, so I play everything late because I wait for things to go on sale. <laughs> yeah. If it's not an EA game and I can't get it through work, I, <laughs> I'm i going to wait until I'm... Uh, until I don't have to pay full price. Totally. Uh, so I'm playing God of War Ragnarok right now. Ooh, fun. Kind uh, of, so I felt a lot of similarities combat-wise with... A lot of similarities. Survivor. I haven't talked to any of, of the game devs I know about this in particular, but I know that some of our devs at Respawn have worked on the previous one. Hmm. Um, I don't know if that means 
like, you know, people took mechanics with them or pitched similar, similar gameplay stuff. But, but I think about it every time I'm like crawling yeah. through a wall like Cal <laughs> does. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of similarities, uh, in a way that I love. So big time. I, I, I felt in particular, even though it's, it's definitely not one to one on the combat between the mm-hmm. two games, I felt like they were each, I think survivors a little more difficult Mm-hmm. At, at like its peak, but that there are similar. I'm not a Souls player, but it's like Souls light, like a baby yeah. steps to. I think with those, with those masochists over there at the Souls games, like <laughs> do. Um, at least when I first played the God of War couple games. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I never played any of them before the previous one in Ragnarok. Um, but so I know tonally they have changed quite a lot. Yes, yeah. Um, but. I'm really enjoying it. It's funny. It's um, something we talk about in my writer's room a lot (laughs) whenever God of War comes up is that it feels like people have watched the creators of that game grow up with the game. Whereas before (laughs) it was just sort of like Game of Game of Thrones brutality and (laughs) we're just doing Norse God uh, rape and pillaging and violence and all that. And now it's like. Games about generational trauma and trying to set the next <laughs> the next youth up to succeed. Yes. It's about there, a bad dad trying to be better. Yeah, truly. Uh it's that was fun too, I think. So I really I think I have a slight preference towards God of War twenty eighteen versus Ragnarok, but I really liked them both. Mm-hmm. Um one of the things that I was most interested in seeing going from eighteen to Ragnarok was how are they going to continue to tell the story? How's this relationship going to involve between, uh, you know, Kratos and, and Atreus, uh, mm-hmm. especially after knowing what we know? And it was just, yeah, I I don't know how far you are, but I'm intrigued to see what you think at the end because I ended up enjoying it a lot. Um, cool. Uh, but yeah, God of War for you too. Um, are you playing that on a, are you a PlayStation 5 player at this point? Mm-hmm. Okay, very cool. Thank I'm going to have to get your... Uh, PSN and and so like we can spy on each other and see what we're playing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, truly this thing that because I've been playing through Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, three months after it came out, I'm like kind of rounding the corner to finish it. Kind of, <laughs> but one of my favorite things to do anytime I have any console open, but I think with PlayStation more often than the others, is uh, I'll see that like oh it says the little icon says I have like six friends online and I just love loving. Going there and being like, "Oh, Johnny Sforzbein's pl- still playing Street Fighter," or <laughs> so, or Mike Steele is doing this. Um, uh, Johnny's always playing Street Fighter. Oh, that guy. Uh, <laughs> not to dox him too much, but uh, the last few days, every time I've been on there, he's been playing Street Fighter. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> um, that's exciting. Uh, I, uh, well, I don't have too many more things I want to ask you during this segment, but w- one thing that I want to ask is, uh, is there another game that you have your eye on whether it's something that has yet to come out or Ooh. or something that you just haven't got the chance to dive into yet. Oh, that is a very good question. Um, I know there's not a lot on the honestly on the docket, large AAA release wise for the rest of the year that we yeah. know of. So let me look. I'm, I've got a I've got a running list going. Oh, nice. I'm vamping for a minute. Um, mm-hmm. uh, these are all old games. Uh, <laughs> and it can be an old game that you just haven't played yet, too. <laughs> I only just learned about uh, Squirrel with a Gun. I'm looking forward <laughs> I to that. don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's exactly what it sounds like. Yes. Uh, you're a squirrel, there's a gun. Um, it sounds... I might be mis... I, I I only just like kind of saw a still from it and then was like, all right, I'm going to look for that. Sure. It sounds like Untitled Goose Game a bit. Oh, okay. Where it's like kind of puzzles, but it's pretty comedy based and it's yes. pretty, um, oh, interesting. pretty indie. Um, do you have a game? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, there's, there aren't any triple A's in the near future that I know about. Yeah. You know, for me right now, it's a lot of like indie stuff that's come out over the last few months that I just haven't played yet. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a game that came out 
two games that I want to highlight. One called Animal Well. Have you heard about this at all? No. It, it came out maybe two or three weeks ago. It's gotten a ton of buzz. It's sort of a 2D, it's a pixel art style game that, it's a Metroidvania. Is this sort of, I guess, you know, action exploration. But I guess there's a lot of mystery to it. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of like, not exactly like Mist, but a lot of like obscure puzzles. And and it doesn't, uh, there are a lot of Mist similarities actually outside of the gameplay. Um, they don't force feed you a lot of information. So it's a lot of really cool discovery is what I've gathered. Um, I want to play that. And then a game that just looks so fun that I've yet to play is Penny's Big Breakaway, which is... This, like, I don't know that either. I'm going to write it, this down. Yeah, it looks – it's done by – um, gosh, what was it? Well, I'm not sure if you've ever met him. I'm, I already name-dropped him on the show, but Mike Steele, which is Jake Sprague's best childhood friend. Um, oh! Do you know this guy? Yeah, I've not actually met him, but I've heard Jake talk about him. Like another person who's been on a lot of episodes of this show, just a, <laughs> who I met because he listened to – to this show because jake was on it and we just became friends and now we like i was talking to him today he also works in games development um unfortunately you know this fucking state of the industry was just recently laid off at private division Uh, so just happening everywhere yeah awful he worked on games like ollie ollie world and uh a a bunch of stuff but penny's big breakaway is this like sort of 3d platformer that looks kind of like a throwback to like uh, Sonic Adventure 2 or Super mm-hmm. Mario Sunshine and um, I missed it a couple months ago and I really want to get to it. Cool. Yeah. Um, I thought of one. Oh, please. Uh, Zao? I'm not 100% I'm saying it right, but I'm... it it looks gorgeous. <laughs> yes. Isn't this also a sort of side-scrolling Metroidvania looking game? I think so. Maybe. I'll double check really quick, but I think I'm thinking of the right one. Yeah. The reviews are are glowing yes tales of kinzara zao mm-hmm. i think yes this it's so funny this i played the new prince of persia mm-hmm. game that came out this year and they're very similar and i loved that one so this one also looks fantastic i think it's yeah. might i don't know if it's game pass but i had a couple friends who played it yeah uh it it came out on playstation plus oh um, cool so it's it's out and about um i i'm ashamed i can't remember the actor's name but he's from um is it raised by wolves um the, the, there's an actor who uh gosh i'm apologize i don't remember the name he's a wonderful actor yeah and this game is a game he pitched not working in games prior uh to uh, be about essentially his journey dealing with uh, the loss of his father. Whoa. And it's a game about navigating grief. Oh, my uh, goodness. And it's being called, like, the Black Panther of video games. Holy moly. Yeah. Because it's all awesome. very, like, Afrofuturism. It's it's very, uh, it's, it's very um, action-based, but also deeply moving. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. Oh, like you even bringing that up is is starting to piece things together for me. Have all the video game podcasts I listen to, I've have heard a good deal about this. It's just been maybe like a month, so yeah, this looks good. It looks like it's out on like everything. Yeah, Windows, Switch, PS Five, Xbox. That's awesome. Yeah, Tales of Kinzara Zhao. Um, the last thing I want to ask you before we finally had to break is, <laughs> um, I think when we met, I was. I don't think I had finished Tears of the Kingdom. I have finished it at this point. Um, I want to also have you back again because I do these, this format that I mentioned earlier where I bring back like three guests, three former guests at a time to list their top 10 personal favorite games ever, which is fun, but also it's a grueling task because people are like, how am I supposed to make this list of only 10? Um, Ooh, I think about this stuff all the time. I'm ready. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have to have you back, but. I'll just tell you before I let you say whatever you want to about Tears of the Kingdom um, that I love that game so much that it is currently tied as my like 1B favorite game of all time. Nice. And I knew it as I I was playing it. I was like, I can't believe how much I love this. And 
as much as we both, you know, love Breath of the Wild and have talked about it so much together, um, I thought narratively it was also personally, I, I thought it was leaps and bounds better than the first or more satisfying for me. Agreed. And so, God, I just, I couldn't believe how much I loved Tears. Like it was, it was amazing. I was like, I was like, I remember finishing the game and I was emotional. I couldn't believe yeah. it. Yeah. Um, uh, is there anything, and without, is there anything you want to say about the game? You're such a Zelda head, and we've <laughs> talked about Breath of the Wild so much that I just want to leave a little space in case you had anything you wanted to say about it. Yeah, the the narrative structure of that game is weird in a way that I'm really into. Yeah. Um, I, if anyone's heard me on the previous episodes where I'm just gushing at nauseum about Zelda and ranting all my Zelda theories. I will say there was a <laughs> teeny tiny piece of me that wanted like more um, lore answers. Mm. Uh, and so part of it was like, I still don't totally know who the Zonai are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that's excessive. That's that's a me problem, not a them problem. <laughs> um, and I also like, I know how game lore works in a more intimate way now. Mm. And I... You know, that's that's a whole discussion for another day that I understand like, OK, no, nope, they delivered they delivered what they set out to deliver. And I yeah. love it. Um, but the for anyone who's played it, I won't um, I won't give specifics. But like what is actually the middle of the game is it feels like the end of the game when you're getting to it. And and I couldn't believe that it it was still. The main story quest that you're following initially, and you're trying to, you know, you're going to all the, uh, all the, they're not divine beasts anymore. Yeah, but what, all are, those what are sages? They in this game? Yeah. Um, and uh, you think that's going to lead you up to the finale, like, like Breath of the Wild did, and the way it would make sense it would, and mm-hmm. then the the next boss fight you have feels like the finale. And then it is not the finale. Yeah. You got a whole bunch of game left. It's very cool. Yeah, that's, it's so, I wonder, I wish I could just see like a chart of what, how, what percentage of players experienced parts of the game when, because strangely enough, for me, I stumbled upon the thing that they point you to at that moment beforehand. Ooh, because you were just investigating everything. I, I, yeah, I was just thorough and like, it was just one day where I didn't even know, I was like, what's this thing over here? Not co- thinking at all that there could be something more, more than just, you know, exploring a sky island or whatever. Mm-hmm. And Skyland. I, a, a, yeah, a sky island, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, please forgive me. Uh, but <laughs> I was just blown away at that. So when I reached that point of the game, I actually was like, I think there was even a dialogue moment where you're talking to your party and then they're like, oh. You already did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of my one of my friends uh, was like, "I don't want to finish the main story, so I'm going to put it off. I'm going to do everything else I can possibly do. Was going to all the shrines, was yeah. doing every side quest, and then didn't realize that wasn't the end of the game, but had done everything. Oh. So by the time they kind of have that reset." Uh, all the characters were like, you need to go do this. Actually, complete. You did that already. Yeah. Well, now you have to, nope, complete. <laughs> Just really that, ran through everything. That almost sounds like the beginning of a, of a sketch uh, <laughs> right there. That's good. Um, uh, well, great. Uh, is that, did you get to say what you wanted to about the game, at least for now? Oh, it's just gorgeous. It's so yeah. nice to be back. Yeah. I, just, I love it so much. <laughs> yeah. And now truly, because I think the creators have said they're they're not going to be making the next game in this same exact storyline, you know, not another, yeah. like, not another, not, uh, not a perfect as my brain breaks, not another, <laughs> like, uh, the third part of this series. That's not yeah. what the next one will be. So I'll be interested to see what happens. Um, yeah. I, I wish it was a trilogy, and I, I wish that we could close the loop on this Hyrule a little more. But yeah. I they've also knocked it out of the park for the last however many games, so I, I trust whatever they're doing. Except I am very stressed out about what whatever movie they're making. How, yes. It's, it's a great thing that, that someone's finally trying it, but I'm, I'm really concerned. I think concern is the way I would describe my feelings too. Con- or concerned because 
I mean, look, I know that the Mario movie was like a movie for kids and stuff, but I also personally was just like, I had a great time because I went to to see it for a friend's birthday and it was like a bunch of adults in a theater and we were all yeah. laughing, even at mostly at points we, we weren't supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> I was not, pretty negative on that movie. And so I'm just really hopeful that who that the people Nintendo has put this in the hands of uh, just at least try their best and do right. I, I would have thought that like I'm echoing other people's points that like an animated sort of Ghibli style movie would have been like the way. I mean, to that go. feels so obvious. Yeah. I don't understand. I mean, live action sounds risky on its own. For all the reasons. Yeah. But, like, you, they have such a built-in gorgeous art style. I don't know why they didn't do that. And then on top of it, like, some, uh, not that there are no good video game adaptations. Like, you know, Last of Us knocked it out of the park. Mm. Um, Fallout, if anyone's watching that right now, I loved every episode. I thought yes. they absolutely crushed it. And part of that is it's a fully realized world that they started a new story in. Mm. It, this, that story's not in any of the games. Uh, and I think that's really smart because then you don't get in trouble with the fans when you know people's got opinions about what you're using, what you're not using, what you're changing mm-hmm. and all that. Um, and also you you have the freedom to structure it like a proper TV show as opposed to trying to uh, shoehorn game narrative into into a cinematic uh, uh, place. And so I think it would be great if whatever the Zelda movie is going to be was its own mm. new version, not like this is the Breath of the Wild movie or this is the Twilight Princess movie. I think it would be great if it was a new installment, but yeah. also by its nature, Link and Zelda are repeating the main beats so what are they gonna do in a movie they yeah. can't really get that far away from it or else yeah. it's not really zelda you bring up a great point because while uh, that is kind of the cool hook of most of the zelda games is that it is kind of a completely new story each time there is the timeline that does you know connect them i say with air quotes mm-hmm. all together so maybe that almost makes me slightly hopeful. Like maybe there's more of a window that I thought to make something new and original in the in this sort of established Zelda universe that we know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, I just also have no idea how they're gonna handle Link as a character because, oh, like, yeah. you know, I think if we write a lot of main characters in in game writing pretty flat and neutral on purpose because they're supposed to be the vessel the player injects themselves into. And so you keep it sort of open. Um, And Link is one of the strongest versions of that. He doesn't say a damn word. (laughs) I mean, you know, he has reactions and the NPCs kind of react based on, you know, the dialogue choice you make. Uh, But we don't, we as players have never heard Link and, and they keep it pretty loose with his dialogue mm. that is his text dialogue that is we don't you don't really have a sense of link's personality at any point and that's on purpose uh but how do you make a main character of a movie built around that yeah like what what direction are they gonna go Ugh, there's so many disastrous there's so many landmines like yeah. that they could step on with that uh we'll see uh I'm rooting for him <laughs> I know, me too. All I know is that if and when any cast announcements or trailers or anything comes out, I know I'm going to be texting you about it yep. just to see how we're feeling. Uh, Likewise. Gosh. Uh, well, a lot to look forward to uh, or fear about. Um, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. Uh, and then when we come back, we'll finally get into all things uh, missed with your experience. So, Heather, I'll see you on the other side. Okay, I'll see you then. Bye. <laughs> Welcome back to Call Me by Your Game. I, Connor McCabe, am still here with our guest for today's episode, Heather Woodward. Heather, I am still back. here and still available. Yes, yeah, so still. Oh, hey, just in case, listener, you forgot about that. Ooh, <laughs> you're not going to forget it now. Nope. Um, 
here we are in the main event of the show. Uh, before we get into your personal experience, I would want to I want to do some table setting for this game for the listener, even though this is not the first time we've talked about it. Um, but if you want to jump in at any time and interject something or be like, Connor, actually, this is how this was. You've got the green light. Um, sure. Otherwise, I'll just monologue for a little for or a couple paragraphs worth. Monologue uh, away. All right. So here I go. Mist is an adventure game designed by Rand and Robin Miller, brothers, actually. Uh, it was developed by Cyan Inc. and published by Broderbund, first released for 1993, or in 1993 for the Macintosh computers. Uh, in the game, the player travels via a special book to a mysterious island called Mist. The player interacts with objects and traverses environment, the environment by clicking on pre-rendered imagery. Uh, the f- I mean... There have been many uh, iterations of this game. It's been like ported and remastered many times, but yeah. the original version was, uh, I guess, the way that I might describe it is it's like kind of like a clickable PowerPoint where you're walking through environments. Sort mm-hmm. of. Do you have a better way you might describe how that felt? That's pretty good. I mean, they uh, uh, they they are more or less still images, and and you you are trying to click on items or directions you're going to go in and and it takes you to the next is still image or still frame rather um yeah so <laughs> comparing it to a powerpoint is kind of right just a powerpoint that can go in multiple 3d dimensions yes uh i've never fooled around with i fooled around with like older versions of this game i would I wonder how jarring it would feel to play like a more modernized version where you could like sort of free roam. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe just that might just be because I'm so and many people are probably so used to that original version. Um, yeah. It's I, go ahead. I've sorry. done those. I've I've oh. uh, one of the one of the remakes. I think you can set it up to to for a smooth uh, oh. free roam or, or at least within one frame. I don't think you can actually. I don't remember. Um, but at least within the frame, you can kind of walk, you can kind of be loose with your image a bit. Um, but uh, also then uh, I played through to, I played through Miss 3. I don't think I pay, played any of the following ones. Hmm. Um, but that one is kind of free roam. Okay. And it's so much harder <laughs> because it, you, you don't, Mist in its beautiful but slightly primitive way, like set you up to look at a certain frame and you know there's something I need to pick out in this frame. But if you have control of the view, you can miss everything. Yeah. Just And I did. Yeah. I that's I hadn't even thought about how that could set early players up for I mean, it's still challenging, but success as opposed to being like, oh now you also have to find the kind of frame you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, uh, especially because they do like to. Well, I don't remember if three did it as much. One doesn't do it so much, but like Riven, which is number two, does a lot of like line up this perspective to get this oh. clue stuff. Hmm. And if you if you're able to free roam, it's impossible. It's, yeah. <laughs> you, you already that game is already gorgeous, but basically impossible. Uh, and then to add. And we're not going to help you by telling you what to look at. It's it's a bunch of beautiful pictures and not much to accomplish. Yeah, goodness. Um, but but thank you for for lending us a little bit of your you know experience and expertise there. I think one thing I want to describe too is the uh, the visuals of this. It's you know it's a game from originally from 1993. Uh, it's the images you're looking at while they are still frames, with the exception of some objects moving occasionally. Um, are these 3D pre-rendered images? Uh, one of my favorite games of all time uh, is this pro- it's a program really called Microsoft 3D Movie Maker. Mm-hmm. And whoa, it, do you know that one? Yeah, I mean, throwback, um, but yeah, it truly was. I mean, when I did my first my the solo episode I did of episode 100 on this show, um, that's what I talked about. Uh, just because it truly set me off on a path of like uh movie making and stuff like that Aww. um all that said is that a lot of the environments in that game are also these like gorgeous 3d pre-rendered backgrounds i think you see a lot of this stuff also on like the playstation one 
like I'm thinking of like Final Fantasy seven and mm, eight and nine, yeah. like the backgrounds. But that's kind of what it looks like. Um, solving puzzles uh, allows the player to travel to other worlds, which they call ages in this game, which reveal the backstory of the game's characters to, and help make uh, help the player make the choice of whom to aid. Uh, the Miller brothers had started uh, working in game development, uh, creating black and white, largely plotless works aimed at children originally, but they wanted this game, Myst, to be a graphically impressive title with a non-linear story and mystery elements aimed at adults. Uh, the game's design was limited by uh, the small amount of memory, footprint, uh, video game consoles at the time, and the slow CD-ROM drives back in the day. <laughs> um, and it was created... Uh, on Apple Macintosh computers and ran on the HyperCard software stack. More on that in the fun facts section. Uh, uh, <laughs> though ports and other platforms have required the creation of a new engine, kind of like we were talking about, where like this, there's se- several versions of this game, um, obviously not just using HyperCard. Um, yeah. Lastly, is about the little bit about the success and the legacy. Uh, it was a critical and commercial success. Uh, this is a game that. When I have heard other people talk about it on whether it's YouTube videos or podcasts, they would say that, well, well first of all, it was until The Sims came around, the highest selling game of all time. Yep. Um, but a game that like just captured people growing yep. up, which could be getting into your story. I might be stepping on your toes a bit, but yep. it was kind of like a monumental title. Um, yeah. Critics lauded the ability of the game to immerse players in its fictional worlds. Um, It's been called one of the most influential and best games ever made. Uh, And um, it has been ported to multiple platforms and remade several times. Of course, there's been spinoff games and and sequels. There's a lot of stuff. It's a huge, hugely influential game. Um, Heather, when it comes to like the context or table setting, is there anything else that you think we should include before we dive into like your history with it? I think that's pretty good. I mean, this will, you know, segue into my history, but uh, it's if you've never played it or you've never looked at it, it's it's hard to. To uh, overstate how gorgeous it is, how the the world building in it is so haunting. Every age you go to is is every world is uh, feels fully lived in but there's also no people in it so it feels um as beautiful as it feels scary when you're first playing it um yeah it's hard it's hard to express just how stunning it was and this is also 3d games weren't happening yet Mm -hmm. and so i'm uh uh 84 years old right now so i can't i i was playing this game in real time um and uh uh it it was it was the sort of thing where it was like uh, when Game Boy Color came out and we were all like, can you believe it? Now my Game Boy has color. <laughs> where it's like, it's actually not, it, it it's not that big of a jump. Yeah. But it felt monumental. That's what Mist felt like. Mm. Yeah. It's, I, you know, I'm only 81, so a few years younger than you. Right. Uh, so I don't, I did not get to experience this for myself, but... Uh, I can I can definitely put myself in that in those shoes as someone who did ex- did not just play games as a kid but who was like fascinated by like computer games because they were a totally it felt like a totally different thing for a while as a child. Yeah. And I really wish I could like I, mean, I could probably just set this up today where I just get an old cop the oldest copy I can find of Mist, set myself up here at the computer and put some headphones on. Um, yeah. Anyway, I think it's easy to get. Um, I I think. I replayed it uh, over the pandemic uh, mm. uh, on my iPad, and they give the oh. option of the remaster or the original. That's fantastic. Which is the way to do it, because if you do find a legit old CD-ROM copy, uh, the odds of it working are... <laughs> yeah. I th- or it might, it might frustrate you more than the education feels good for. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, it's a really helpful guide from you, actually. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I actually, this is, I basically have no history with this game outside of playing, um, and it's not about me, so it doesn't matter, but on game, it was available on Game Pass for a minute, so I did, you know, poke around on that, and then also over the pandemic, um, 
I went to a like retro video game store in like this part of LA I'm never in. And oh no, it wasn't even a retro called store. Called the Valley. Yeah, called yeah. I thought, I'm oh, kidding. you'll never. I won't be caught dead in the Valley. <laughs> um, it was actually I'm remembering not a retro store. It was a thrift shop. And while the person I was with was looking at different things, I was just poking around, and I I found an, the original Mist guide, and I still yes! I still have it. I I I'm sorry that I didn't bring it here to like show you, which would be great for YouTube, but um. <laughs> It's great. I, I remember my good friend, who I don't, I don't know if you've met before. Her name's Courtney Venez. Uh, she's the person who came on to talk about this game on episode twenty-five. So, you know, thirteen episodes after yours. But I promised her this guide so long ago, and I still haven't given it to her. And I've seen her many times. So uh, someday, those, boy, I if we were. It was the Wild West back then. It you, you either had to go purchase a book to help you through, yeah, or figure it out, or never figure it out, which is what I did with Mist for a while. Um, it's uh, the kids these days again, eighty four years old, but like mm. having inter- having the internet to like just give you that hint to get past that one thing that's driving you crazy. It was so, so much helpful. harder back then, yeah. And then a game like Mist, which is the first of its kind on a on a large scale and uh really hard <laughs> it's so just, obscure it was unplayable Europe, without that yeah. guide but it was worth it to even just play through it with the guide because it was yeah. so compelling oh i've so, so so someday i'm gonna do that with the guide i think and then finally give it to my friend but I want to finally, you know, stop talking about myself and get into your history with it. Do you remember? Hang on, I have about 10 more questions for you. No. Huge. Uh, although, although so, something fun about this episode is that has happened a couple of times where I've <laughs> gotten to talk more about myself uh, and games than usual. So uh, huge, uh, huge for me. Um, <laughs> but I'd love to hear how you even came to play this. Was this something that you stumbled upon? Did it just appear in your home? Uh, were you anticipating it? Stumbled upon in that it appeared in somebody else's home. So okay. I, uh, we had Nintendo's uh, full time. Nintendo was our babysitter, um, <laughs> but we didn't have CD ROMs. And also, by like then when we did, my parents were really like buying those games for us. It was like yeah, yeah, campaign for the one Nintendo game oh. at Christmas, and then that's what you just play forever. Um, But uh, my friend, who uh, had money and stuff, um, (laughs) had missed and was like, you want to see this cool, weird thing? And I was like, yeah. And as happened a lot with this friend, really what she wanted to do was show off the thing she had that I didn't. And then I got really into it. And then I was starting (laughs) to make headway on it. And then she was like, well, why aren't you playing with me now? And yeah. I was like, because I'm eight and this is awesome. Yeah, and I don't get um, to do this ever. Yeah, because yeah. I love this and I need to know what their deal is. Yeah. <laughs> but I was young. I mean, I was, yeah, I think I was under 10 at the time. Mm. Um, and I uh, I could poke around every now and then. You pull a lever that makes something else do something. But it yeah. felt so, it, it felt It didn't feel like there was a puzzle that was an option. It was like, I can tell they're giving me a lot of information. Mm -hmm. I'm too young to figure this out. This is also a world before escape rooms. I feel like it's easier to play Myst and its sequels now because if you frequent escape rooms, like I do, um, it's the same sort of, you're looking for the same puzzle clues. Oh, okay, there's a weird piece of information right here that feels out of place. I'm going to hold on to it because it's probably going to be a code for something over here um those things weren't around or at least not in my life at the time Mm -hmm. so it really just felt like i'm flipping through books i'm flipping every lever i find i don't know how to make anything happen (laughs) and then i got the guide and then i just followed my way through it oh so you eventually got the guide yourself yeah at a certain point so it was something like several years later if i was Mm. under 10 years old when I was first playing it and desperately just trying to like leech time off my friend's computer. Um, I didn't end up getting it until somewhere like late high school. Mm. 
Wow. Um, yeah, because again, my parents didn't want to spend money on anything. Yeah. And that's why I'm only playing Ragnarok now. <laughs> um, <laughs> they pass that on to you. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm a game professional, and I'm not playing things in real time. What is wrong with me? Um, That's but, a different spinoff of the show that we'll dive yeah. into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so I got it later, and I was older, and I was like, well, I love this game, and nobody else knows this game around me. I didn't ha- really have friends who played games like that. Um, and I was like, I'm so much older now. I could definitely do it without the guide. And I didn't have time to finish it with the guide anyway when I was playing it at my friend's house because it wasn't my game. Yeah. She didn't want me to play it. Um, but I was a real twerp. And so was she. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I I was all amped to finally give it an honest go. Yes. Still could not make headway through it. <laughs> uh, and then... Uh, I replayed it again sometime in college with the same spirit and got a little further. Now having looked at guides at two separate occasions yes. and still knowing what I'm looking at, couldn't quite crack it. Gosh, I When game makes me feel like that, there's few things that make me feel dumber where I'm just like, I even kind of know what I'm looking for here. Yeah. And I'm just not able to make headway. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting that you've had uh, uh, that this was kind of a recurring game at different periods of your life. That, um, but I, I kind of interrupted you talking a little bit about that third sort of experience with it. Yeah, yeah, where I I <coughs> did better, but yeah. every, it was like every major puzzle. I eventually had to be like, I know what I need, kind of. Why can't I find it, or why is this not going together right? Um, I, I mean, I would argue that it, it, being the first of its kind, you know, you don't learn the lessons until you put the thing out. And totally. I think the lesson we've learned is that a lot of those games are too hard, yeah. <laughs> are unreasonable. <laughs> yes. um, they're, they're so nicely, the clues are so nicely buried that you can almost not get, I'm a smart person and I like yes. puzzles and I, I still couldn't. And then when I replayed it over the pandemic, played it with my husband who had never played it. Oh, and I let wow. him kind of take the lead because I had played it so many times and he was experiencing it for the first time. Oh so I was sort of the cheat guide. And I I almost never had to actually look up the hints. Wow. But not never. Yes. So. Just just uh, improvement over it with each playthrough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All it's taken was 70 years. Yeah, that's it. Well, yeah. how did that um did you two end up finishing it? Did you also just like get through part of it that you were satisfied with? We finished it. Oh my gosh, what was that? Was it satisfying all these years later? Was it just like, oh, that was it? Yeah. Um It is pretty satisfying. That would actually be more of a question for him cuz I already knew where it was going. Oh, sure. And I played the next couple of games. And I read the books like a real dweeb. No way. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I didn't even like reading when I was a kid. I didn't, I wasn't very good at reading and I didn't yeah. like doing it and it stressed me out and I didn't enjoy books. Uh, and then somebody got me the missed books and I read those in a week. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to do a little rewinding here. Back to when you were a kid and maybe that initial fasc- fascination. I know you've kind of, you've been talking about it a little bit, but... If you had to put your finger on it, what was it about this game, seeing it at your friend's house or first diving in, that, like, caught your attention? Some of it is just the technology, just that these are pre-rendered 3D spaces. Uh, I had just never seen anything like that before. Uh, And and the world building is so gorgeous, and it feels so perfectly moody and haunting. Uh, I was also, like the wimpiest of kids so it was a little bit scary yeah but the game doesn't have any scares there's no jump scares it just feels it's that kind of vacant feeling it's kind of like um if you saw the movie skin of a rink like didn't. uh uh hot take you don't have to but <laughs> uh it, it's it is masterful at tension building it's a horror movie that's supposed to feel essentially like a dream Okay. Like a, like a nightmare. And so because of that, it's not very satisfying because it doesn't like really have a narrative or a, or an end. Mm. But um, 
But what they do is what uh, the essence of a, what makes mist really gripping is like by staying on a shot and staying within an environment and you control how long you stay in mist, but the world is so vast, no matter what you're kind of in that, that vastness, um, your brain starts to scan for what's coming next. Yeah. And they don't give you anything next. And so you're always kind of waiting for someone to jump out at you or someone to walk into frame or anything. And then when they don't, you're just sort of stuck in that high anxiety place. Yeah. Um, I will say then in Riven, I'll spoil this for anyone. Um, <laughs> I'll spoil this 30 year old game. Um, <laughs> uh, they do. There are some actors that like, they don't jump out. They're not jump scary, but they'll, you'll, you'll click to a neck to the next frame. And then someone will like, walk across and kind of look at you and then run away Ooh. and you don't interact with any of them. Or if people are talking to you, they are, it's a scene and they're talking directly to you and you're, you're in it for a minute. Um, but just seeing humans freaked me the hell out. <laughs> it was just, that's the other thing. Oh, that's worth saying too, is not just these beautiful 3d haunting spaces, but there was video. I mean, there were there, right. the cinematics are are people on blue screens, um, but they're people, not not video game characters, not you know fully yeah. designed people. Not like, like a three D model or anything. Yeah, yeah, we had just barely started getting like photos on our computers, and now all of a sudden there are people talking to me on it. It freaked me the fuck out. I bet. <laughs> It like great. it's it's so interesting to see you know the, co- the sort of the combination, and I'm a lot more familiar with this game than 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 Riven or any of the sequel other mm-hmm. sequels. But um, yeah, the sort of almost building this baseline atmosphere of the that unsettling nature, like you're saying, this emptiness of like, is there kind of like being in a theme park alone? If if someone mm-hmm. were to ever experience that, um, you may never feel like you're alone. Combined with this new tech and yeah. Seeing, because I've seen a couple of these scenes play out before these these little FMVs, yeah, and there's something also unsettling about those. Yeah, yeah, so it's something about the tone combined with you know you don't have control. It's not like playing an RPG now where where you can run away or you can like get ready to fight or anything. It's you know that once they're talking to you, you have to sit there and wait. And that should be a comfort and probably is to to less wimpy people who <laughs> like they're not going to do anything and I can't do anything to them. I just got to wait for the cinematic to play out. But it they're talking right to you, like yeah. looking at the play at you through the computer screen. It's all first person. So it's it feels really stressful and really confrontational, even though they can't hurt you. Absolutely. This is an overused term at this point, but. Like it did have a level of immersion to it that I'm yeah. sure was helped, you know, get people into that mindset of just focusing on the game and to where it made the the atmosphere like that more effective, that much more effective, yeah. probably. Yeah, and it's just like ambient sounds. There's not mm. like a a major soundtrack or anything, and things there are sound sound effects that happen when you interact with stuff, but like otherwise, you're just kind of in it. It's just kind of quiet. They're not. They're not really trying to overdo it, and that makes it even more effective. Yeah. Um, I will say, they um, each game improves on the technology, and the games get bigger, the puzzles get a little more sophisticated, and then also the cinematics and how you interact with characters do evolve. Uh, I I only played through three, so it's not uh, hadn't gone too far. If you can do a lot, I don't th- I don't think you have any companions in any of the games, but, gotcha. um, but I'm going to spoil the end of three. All of these games also have multiple endings, which is, which made it so fabulous. Yeah. And they're full but- cinematics that play out. And, and often with like, it's very hard to get the good happy ending oh. on all of them. And then there's like nine endings where things go totally sideways and the universe collapses. Oh my uh, goodness. If you're, I'll send you some videos, but to anyone listening, like if you want to see some wild shit, 
Um, look up the endings from Riven. I I I felt it was the kind of thing where I was like, I don't I didn't know you could do that, and now I'm worried that it's happening in my house. Oh my god! I'm, I'm so I, it, it felt so consuming. Um, but in the last in in the third Riven, no third Mist, um, there's a uh, character turns, and then it's. You're trying to save one person, and then this guy is kind of being wild, but he sounds like he's maybe telling the truth. So you have to decide who you trust. There are a lot of ways to get it wrong, and several of those ways end with that guy killing you with a hammer. (laughs) Oh, my. I could not believe. Like, a lot of the endings are like, he caught you, and now you're in a cage, and we're going to slow fade out as you realize you're, you're going to die buried alive in this cave or like you know a lot of them are like just sad like now you're gonna be here forever i was trapped now it's you in (laughs) in a lot of the endings if you make yourself trapped with him he gets mad and he runs at the camera with a hammer and then you're killed with a hammer (laughs) that must have been so disturbing to witness just full leaping back from the computer Gosh, no, thank you. Wow. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't think they would come at me. No, dang, just so much that this series went on to like <laughs> continue to build through yeah. that game too. That's that's impressive. Um, <laughs> uh, I've got a couple questions for you. Okay. Um, the first of which is, do you have like a moment or like an area in this game that sticks out to you the most? Oh, I mean, the main island, uh, just because it's uh. <laughs> maybe just because I spent the most amount of time there <laughs> yes, because I couldn't leave but it's also like the hub you keep coming back to and it's got elements of each place you're gonna go and Very that's cool. fun because you see if you look at the map and it's it's what the um title image is uh if you oh if yeah you ever see the box or anything um uh it's cool because each place has such a different tone and then on this one island, they're all sort of, sort of side by side, and that's yeah. that's just a fun aesthetic choice. Um, there's one age I forget what it's called, but it's the age that the three main characters supposedly lived in the most, okay. and they're these like nautical. There's a couple of boats that have been wrecked by weather. By, by cataclysmic uh, events, um, but you still can kind of walk around where they lived, and they're wonderful little bits of environmental storytelling. Ooh. They're they're not they're just like rich and lush and very detailed. One of the guys lives in like a very like regal kind of looking like um, almost royal uh, uh, cabin on a boat. And then the other guy lives in, like, the worst pirates. Like, he's got skulls oh, and bones wow. decorating everything he has. And uh, it it really, it really stuck out. Both are overwhelming in their own way. Uh, yeah. And they're both so clear, uh, such clear windows into the, the two characters. Interesting. So both, like like a compelling environment but also like you were saying kind of gives you drips and drabs of like that environmental storytelling that makes you think like what yeah happened here or it paints a picture for you yeah and there's a i i can't remember how much of this lore is available to you in the game there's a lot there's like a lot of books on shelves you can read (laughs) dozens of pages of which is wild i I didn't go quite that far. Once I realized, like, this isn't going to be just a couple of pages, I'm like, nah, okay, I'll just, I'll pop in and out. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, I can't remember if this, if I got this from the the following games or the or the books. But part of the lore is that Atris, the main character who you start the game with, he's a guy who. The magic is that he can write these books, and if he writes the world out full enough, they, uh, with this magic pen or whatever this magic is he's got, um, the worlds can become real. Huh. And then they also kind of become these civilizations that can grow out of them. Kind of like the episode of uh, uh, 
the the treehouse of horrors where <laughs> Lisa's tooth experiment starts to grow like a full colony. Yes. Uh, it's like that. <laughs> if he builds the world out uh, uh, detailed enough, colonies will start to, to grow on them. Yeah. Uh, and then he builds them to be these places he can live and he's trying to chase the perfect world. Um, and then his his sons who are power hungry uh, get weird and then they also start messing with the books and they start messing with the worlds and so the second anything's out of balance everything goes out of balance mm-hmm. and that's why all these worlds are kind of abandoned and that's why a lot of them are like waterlogged or now this one's under fire or this one is uh, uh, was full of people but now nobody's there and it's, it's a it's a really interesting little bit of sci-fi yeah big time very compelling uh gosh just so much mystery but also just giving you the right amount to keep that intrigue really Mm -hmm. pumping uh that's great um i want to do to jump into a little more of the we've got we got great like sort of like four eras of you playing this game which is amazing (laughs) um i would like to hear about that uh do a little scene painting actually and going back to your friend's uh room or like wherever the computer was set up can you scene paint that room for me and and like take us back a little bit yeah okay so it's in my rich friend's house uh in their computer room in new jersey yep uh uh northern new jersey uh uh she it was in there like they had like an upstairs den like a tv room that had the the family computer in it uh very and, nice and also a tv and a couch and stuff and we'd like slumber party in there sometimes um uh-huh. not to be confused with the downstairs tv um but uh uh she had all sorts of games all the all the games that weren't nintendo games that i played as a kid i played there and it was oh, the wow. kind of family where it was like I was dropped off at their house for days at a time. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> like, yeah. My family, our family and their family were best friends. And um, and likewise, she'd come over to our house. I and- truly have a, a f- my best friend growing up is this person to me. Like, I'm the you of that. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, this is great. I'm, I'm totally in. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but she, she didn't like uh, games nearly as much as I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... It was always sort of a trap for her. She also like kind of uh, became a shitty bully, but like oh, she, she she like really wanted to flaunt the the financial difference of our families. So would ouch always wanted to show me the games, and I was like, "Jokes on you! I'm gonna play this game." Yeah, <laughs> you shouldn't have shown me that. <laughs> yep, because now I'm not hanging out with you. I am playing Carmen San Diego. <laughs> um, and where is she? I can't find her. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, so uh uh yeah, so it was just like a lot of she I mean it, it she wasn't uninterested. She would kind of like we kind of had to take turns like who is who is in control of the mouse. We'd kind of like play side by side a bit, but then she'd get bored and try to go do something else, then I would be like, ah, "I'm just going to play a little more. Hang on. <laughs> play a lot more." <laughs> yes. Oh, that's um, that's cool. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as like really any of the eras that you've played it into, and I say this knowing you've already you've given so much of the context. Uh, are there any moments that are like tied, and maybe it has to do with like you know you and David playing this game, but mm-hmm. like, is there any moment that sticks out to you of when you were playing it, broad or specific? Um. Yeah, I, David, my husband, it, it, that was that was really fun for me, um, because I had played it so many times prior. Uh, it was really cool to see it through someone's eyes, mm. someone else's eyes for their first time. Yeah, uh, and also to see an adult playing it because even though I revisited it as I got older several times, um, I. You know, I, my primer for it was when I was a kid. So it was, it was really cool. I was never going to see an adult play it for the first time unless I played it with someone. Yes. So I got that by playing it with him. Wow. Uh, and it was, uh, I'm pleased to say it held up. He was as taken by it as I was. That's really cool. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, I'm sure it was also there's... really a relief to see that he struggled with the puzzles as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. I wasn't just a dummy. Yeah, affirming and that that happened and also just it f- probably so- somewhat satisfying maybe to see that it, like you said, it held up and that there was like enjoyment there too. Yeah. And yeah. a little bit of an ego stroke that I could be like, actually, if you if you see the pipes lead uh, the directions, so you need to change the pipes. And that's how we're going to get that machine working. Yes. Uh, as if I hadn't cheated my way through it several times before. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but it was fun to be the expert in the room. Totally. There's there's something funny about playing, especially like a puzzle game or watching someone play a puzzle game who like is open to uh, hints or help like that. Like I've watched mm-hmm. my girlfriend play through the majority of Portal a couple years ago. Fun. And it's interesting how like I try not to like – give the answer but how do you lead someone there when you're just you're with them uh, i don't know if you had that experience at all with that game but it's like finding that middle ground's not always easy yeah um my brother's a big gamer and once uh what was i playing i think i was playing bioshock for the first time oh, wow. and it, I, it was late i had watched him play it a bunch when it first came out ah. um but i wasn't i wasn't really a first person shooter player until basically apex um, so I, uh, so I was playing it late, um, but I was looking for specific things. I really wanted to like, look at how the narrative is told, how the yeah. environmental storytelling works, all that. And my brother couldn't help but give me hints when I didn't need them. He was like, oh, I don't know, but do you hear that? You should probably go check out what that is. <laughs> I was like, I, of course I hear it. Yeah. I'm looking at the vending machine. Yes. I'm at the Circus of Values right now, okay? I want to read all the posters. Yes. Uh, that is that is very funny. Uh, we are coincidentally, that's the current games club that we're doing. We're oh, playing nice. through that chapter by chapter, and we're almost, well, I just finished it the other day, but we're almost done. And also, just a great example, we've been talking about games writing so much on this episode but what a great game to just look at for so many of its narrative choices and uh, yeah. also how they tell it environmentally, but also in in so many ways. Um, yeah, that game is rich. That game yeah. has a lot to give. Have you played Infinite? No. I, I've just started it because we're doing a bonus episode on it. Um, I don't have any thoughts yet. Uh, I also heard a ton about this game, but mm-hmm. just was kind of curious. Um, well, uh Heather, is there uh, anything, just sort of as we sort of wrap up this time talking about Mist, is there anything before you sort of wrap up your thoughts that you haven't gotten to share about this game or any of the times you've played it? Ooh, it, I, I said this a little bit before, but it's the, it's the first time I played a game that had multiple endings and oh. that, that broke my brain. I, um... Also because I didn't play a lot of, like, text games. Uh, because, again, I didn't like reading. And I didn't have the computers that would do it. Uh, <laughs> so the couple of times I played them at the library, I was like, I don't understand what's happening. Um, that's where you would get a multiple ending game prior to Mist. Sure. But Mist was my first. And the fact that there were multiple endings and most of them were wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really... <laughs> really just broke my brain that's so good uh yeah. i had forgotten that you had even like i think that had gotten us to you even talking about reading the novels as a kid which mm-hmm. i almost had totally skipped over so apologies about that um but yeah multiple endings especially one where there's most of them are consequential <laughs> like in a <laughs> negative way yeah uh that's fun um, and the good endings are kind of boring oh, i mean they because because Good is boring. I mean, it's sort of like, wow, we did it. We really solved it. Close the book. Yeah. Uh, but then the the bad endings are like... Just devastating. Yeah. Ugh. Gosh. Uh, I like faintly remember some of them, or at least one of them, like when I did research for the first time I did this four years ago. Uh, I remember it being pretty brutal. Um, <laughs> well, before we get to our post-show segments, um, would you do me a favor... Heather, and just like put a bow on what place this game uh, held for you. Yeah, I had never felt immersion like that. That's that's the take home point. And still 
it's up there with the best. I mean, part of what makes Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom so addictive is is how in the world you feel. And Mist was, I think, for a lot of people, I mean, I think in the industry, the first of that level. Um, even if you're looking at something like Doom or anything, or like if you're, those games scratched at that, but but nothing compared to Mist for a long time. Cool. Um, yeah, it's worth it. There's a yeah. VR port of it that I'm desperate to play. Oh man, that I would have to play. I think something else in VR before I jumped into Mist VR. But that mm. sounds you. We just never see you again. You're just literally yeah. lost in the game. <laughs> yeah, I actually should not play that. Yeah, I, I have a life. I have commitments. If you need somebody to hold you to that, just let me know. I'll be your accountability buddy. <laughs> um, well, we got a couple of post-show segments to close this out. But Heather, thank you so much for bringing this game on. It was so much fun to hear, you know, to not just do this with you again, but to like hear what this game meant to you. So thanks for bringing Mist on today. Thank you. Oh, I love it. It's you, cool. And it's that I can't recommend it enough. And it holds up. Go play it. it this is this is I mean, this happens a lot. This happens more often than not, but this is another one of those times where I'm just like, okay, I really want to go and play this now. Um, yeah. Uh, but before we go, I'll lead us into our uh, last couple of segments, the first of which is the Fact Me by Your Game segment. And that's just where <laughs> I share some fun facts with you, my guest, about the game you brought on. Bring it. So I've got two fun facts, and I will tell you. I looked at my old episode guide for the first time I did this. I made sure to come up with new fun facts and new recommendations. Uh uh, not that anyone gives a shit, but that's what I, I did. I do, Huge. and I appreciate it. Huge. No, no recycled facts for you. Yeah. Um, the first one I have titled Hypercard Ticket to Ride. Now, this mm. fact comes from a YouTube channel called PBS Game Slash Show, and this is uh, the, the missed video that they did. Um, this goes back to the Hypercard technology in which of which the Miller brothers built the game. Uh, so here I go. When designing Mist. The Miller brothers used an old program at the time called HyperCard. This was a system where you navigated files by clicking on links, sort of a precursor to how the modern internet works of like clicking a hyperlink and being taken to a new page, clicking back and going back. So this was sort of like the building blocks and bones for how they built this sort of what I had affectionately referred to as this PowerPoint-esque <laughs> one screen at a time yeah. uh, presentation from Mist. Uh, Every individual screen visited in Mist uh, was its own card with clickable points on that card. Uh, this is the one way. Uh, this is one way that they were able to pull off the feeling of exploring the 3D world of Mist during a time where rendering fully 3D environments was extremely limited, especially for ones with the amount of detail that Mist had. You talked about the detail in this game mm -hmm. uh, a few times, even that original version, and yeah, obviously. We're not in a place, I think, at this time where you were going to be walking around free roaming the environment, but they found a way to at least give that sort of feeling, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, you feel like you have more control than you actually do. Yeah. Oh, big time. Um, so that's the first one. The second fact I have uh, has to do with a little bit of the inspiration for the game, and I have this titled 20,000 Leagues of Inspiration. Uh, now, nice. Mist. Uh, had many influences, as we could have guessed, uh, from games like Zork to the Star Wars mythic universe, and even the concept of portals to other worlds like in the Chronicles of Narnia. The game's name, however, and more importantly, the solitary and mysterious atmosphere of the island, was influenced by the Mysterious Island, which is a book by the author Jules Verne. Um, I had never heard of this book, The Mysterious Island. I know Jules Verne's a couple of his other works. Had you yeah. heard of this ever? Only when I wanted more mist. Yes. <laughs> Only when I was trying to look up stuff about mist forever ago. Um, I'll let you finish. I have a fun fact about your fun fact, but Ooh, uh, I'll I can't let you wait. finish. Um, yeah, really all I had to say was that this is a book of where five prisoners of war crash land on a volcanic island and discover a series of uh, mysteries. I have like a hyperlink to the to the book itself, but... That was kind of it. What's your... I haven't read it, but I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this. I'm gonna, yeah, me too. I'm going to dig it up. Um, my fun fact about that fun fact is that there is a puzzle in Mist. That is the way you get to um, the waterlogged world. Oh. And uh, first of all, I don't know how other people 
play. I mean, it's not impossible to figure out piano, but there's a little piano. There's a spooky little piano you oh. find, and you have to, you have to play a melody you find elsewhere. And I play piano. I I learned it from when I was a kid. So I. I knew what to do, but that's another one of those puzzles that I'm like, how is anyone going to do this? I, <laughs> does everyone know what the note values are? Um, but the tune that you play, if you happen to be able to put these two things together, is the theme from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Oh, no way. Yeah. That's a great little full circle fact on a fact. Mm-hmm. I love that. Isn't that cool? That- Oh, that's really cool. Uh, I've never seen uh, the movie. Or I'm sure there's I, – I would guess that from a property that old, there's uh, multiple versions of it. But I did like – now that we're talking about this, I did read – I think I read most of the book like my sophomore or junior year in college hmm. or something. Um, I should movie's fun. One. Yeah. Movie's, I bet. movie's worth a watch. I being a huge a kid who like wouldn't shut up about Back to the Future growing up, I always mm. love that Doc Brown refers to Jules Verne as a big inspiration to him too. Um, <laughs> this is neither here nor there, but anyway, thanks for sharing that, and that'll do it okay. for the Fact Me by Your Game segment, and I'll lead us into the final one of the show, the game recommendations. Now, just in case you don't remember, Heather, I am going to treat um, the this these recommendations or, or rather missed. Uh, this is my forced tie-in to the movie Call Me By Your Name where I'm going to treat that game as your passionate summer fling in Italy. So <laughs> unfortunately, uh, it's not going to work out between you and Mist. So oh. in order to help you get over this heartbreak, I've got three recommendations for you today that all have something in common but that are different. So are you okay. ready to possibly be set up? <sighs> I suppose I'll move on if I have to. Okay. Well, it's still – it's up to you, but okay, I've got okay. three for you today. The first of which is that if you want a game heavy on missed inspiration but with more puzzles, I'll recommend uh, a game that I thankfully have in my Steam library. It's called The Witness. Do you know this I game? I have played The Witness. Ah. I mean, as someone who's played it and is a huge fan of Mist, what do you think? Um, I I really liked it, but I, I started to find it tedious because – Although the puzzles, the mechanics of the puzzles change, there's it. There's just so much of it, and mm. the world building is gorgeous, and it did definitely give me missed vibes. And I think I started playing it after my iPad replay of missed oh, because gotcha. I was looking for more. Um, I I liked it. I got a little little tired of it. Cool, but I really Great. liked it. Well, overall. hey, it sounds like you've. Uh... You know, been on a date with this fling before, so a possible yeah. fling. So who you knows? You know, with, there might be a second date. Who knows? Have you found the the secret, the long secret ending in it? Oh uh, well, I've never played it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well then, uh, give it a look. It's cool. It's, okay. it's It's good puzzle. I think I was also looking for mist in it. Yes, well, that and checks it has out. Echoes of it, but it's not. It's not quite the same. And um, yeah. So okay. It, cool. I love that. Um, Your second recommendation today is that if what you took away from this game was that you just love being on an island, Mm -hmm. you just want to spend the whole game on an island, but instead of creepy, you want to be in a cozy environment, I recommend Animal Crossing New Horizons. Oh, well, of course I played Animal Crossing. I was alive in the year 2020 of our Lord. Yes. uh, (laughs) all Everyone who owned a Switch just uh, played this game into the ground. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So if you but want it to... is I, I I try to go back to it every once in a while mm-hmm. and it I, it's too tied to the pandemic. Yeah. In a way that um it's not like it's triggering. It's more like it was such a safe space in the pandemic and lockdown that now it's like, oh, none of my friends are on. No one's playing this with me anymore. It's not the only way I get to hang out with my brother right now. Like, yeah, it's it was so such a special little treat to have during lockdown um, that I I had to release it. I don't need it anymore now that I'm back out in the world. Big time. I've I've like booted up a couple Animal Crossing since, but never that one. I, mm-hmm. I have a similar feeling too, where I'm like, I almost kind of left it there. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to give you, I've got a bonus rec, so sorry to extend this even longer, but I've got a bonus rec before I get to the last one. Uh, uh, 
basically, uh, I had, I'm sure you know Patrick McDonald. Patrick mm -hmm. was a recent guest on the show and talked about this game called uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark? The Tale of Orpheo's Curse. Did you watch that show growing up at all? Uh, as much as I could, which was not a lot, but I have rewatched some of it recently. There is a computer game that like, I could not help but compare to Myst because the majority of it does take place. It's kind of the same. I bet it was maybe even made in HyperCard. Like it's mm. that one screen format where you're clicking through stuff, you're clicking on stuff. But this game does have like more beings in it and things that like do a creepy movement or whatnot. Uh -huh. So um, they just because they are so dang similar in feeling, it's worth looking up online. It's, it's out right. there. I'm going to um, look it up. We're going to go on a date. Huge. Uh, and then lastly, uh, your final recommendation. If your problem with Mist was that it was too peaceful and, <laughs> and, and, the, and the fact that like while it's creepy, no one's ever attacking you, nothing like that is happening, but you just mm -hmm. want to be hunted for an entire game, <laughs> I'll recommend a game called Vampire Survivors. Have you played this recent phenomenon? Oh, I don't think. No, I haven't played it, but I think my brother was playing it, and I, I, I was like, I don't know how you can do this. This is terrifying. Yes. It is. It's a game where you don't even press a button except to accept upgrades. You just move with the stick, uh, yes, to avoid enemies. But so that's what I thought was funny about this wreck was instead of never getting attacked, you're only getting attacked in this game. <laughs> Yeah. So if you want your heart to jump out of your throat, yes. Uh, try vampire. You know all those things you thought were gonna pop out during mist. What if they did? Yeah. So that's the that's the uh, fun uh, incentive of playing that game. So <laughs> to wrap up the recommendations, we had uh, the witness, Animal Crossing: New Horizons, the bonus of Are You Afraid of the Dark: The Tale of Orpheus Curse, and lastly, Vampire Survivors. Heather, that'll do it for the Rex, and that will bring us to the end of the show. Before um, we go, yes, can please. I give you an additional fun fact? Oh my goodness, I'm just getting spoiled on this episode. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm a big Simpsons fan, uh, and the Treehouse of Horrors, uh, I think it's season six, uh -huh. um, when Homer falls into the third dimension, uh, classic episode. Uh, yeah. That was another one that really broke everyone's brain. It was just like, whoa, they did it. Not in the same, like, I'm spooked, more in a like, wow, I can't believe you can do something like this. And when you watch yeah. it now, it doesn't look amazing, but <laughs> uh, but it was at the time. Um, there, There's a set piece in it that he walks by. There's like a, there's a thing that he walks by that he goes, ooh, expensive. Uh, and he just <laughs> walks by, but then he's also looking at like, koi ponds and just shapes bouncing around and stuff and i i didn't put together until i was an adult doing my annual halloween tree house of horror rewatches that thing he walks by is the library from mist no way because mist was just newly out and or had come out just a couple of years within yeah. um and it's it's the it's the first room you see on the island of mist and and because it was a big 3d phenomena and then they were doing a 3d episode they they put it into the simpsons holy moly i okay uh, this is a bit of a tangent but for the past like year and a half since when i've been like basically working from home not, not having a regular job and all that jazz i almost every day when i make and eat lunch i've been going through the simpsons from the start and I'm uh -huh. on, like, season 11 now, <laughs> so it's a lot of episodes. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been, like, big in Simpsons Zone, so this is, like, the perfect fun fact you could have shared with me. I, yes! have to, I think I have to watch this episode tomorrow at lunch. Yes, do it. It's great. Oh. Um, I mean, it's a great episode that's, top to bottom anyway, um, but, like, that's such a fun, weird detail they threw in yeah. that I I was pl I was the audience for it, and I didn't clock it at the time. Yeah. Um, I would have never guessed that a missed reference would have happened in The Simpsons. That's amazing. Yeah! Gosh. Um, well, thank you for that bonus fun fact. Uh, on your way out, though, is there anything that you want to plug or any place you want people to find you on the Internet? Uh, I, uh, I have a website where I put everything I'm doing, heatherwoodward.com, or everything I uh, managed to update my website with. Cool. <laughs> um, uh, and that's where a lot of my um, videos I've been in or, or things I've written. Um, 
Uh, I occasionally show up at UCB, so I can't plug anything specific right now, but uh, uh, see me maybe uh, by accident. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and of course, I got to plug uh, my beloved Apex Legends. Yeah. Play it. We've got some like really cool content out right now. We've got some really cool stuff in the works. I'm personally working on some stuff I'm really excited about. Uh, and I can't say more than that. Hey, so. now that's a tease in the industry if you've ever seen one. That's good. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's free to play. So if it's you have a system play. that can run it, do it. Uh, yeah. I had it on my – after we had lunch last year, I had it on my computer for a while and was just p- playing it really for the first time. And it was – it's a blast. But Yeah, Heather, it's hard, but there's a, there's a lot of modes that are more beginner friendly. Uh, and and uh, we're, there's all sorts of stuff that we're doing in the game to, to – Get everybody involved. Mm. Well, so so exciting. Uh, thanks again for joining me for this episode, and uh, congrats to uh, it's what a ch- what a cool like career new path that you've had since we did that first episode. Um, thanks. But uh, I'll go ahead and just close this out with some plugs of my own. The show art for Call Me by Your Game is done by Glenn J. You can find him and his other great work on Instagram at Glenn with two Ns dot J. A Y. Uh, you can find us all over social media. Uh, there's links in the show notes for our TikTok, which I'll post some cool highlight from this episode on <laughs> our Twitter, Instagram. We're also on Blue Sky if you're over there, uh, and YouTube if you're listening to this on a podcatcher. Follow us on YouTube. Uh, subscribe. Check out our videos there. If you like listening to us, you're gonna love seeing us. Um, this show <laughs> is also produced edited and the original music at the beginning is by jeremy schmidt uh you can give him a thank you for his work on the show by checking out his podcast video games a comedy show i'm all over social media as well uh including on twitch which you can find me at uh in on that link as well in the show notes twitch.tv slash cons is cool 69 uh and lastly <laughs> if you like me and the conversations i have with people about video games uh check out our patreon uh there you by supporting us uh, for a certain amount of month, whatever you want, we've got a bunch of different tiers. You get bonus podcasts uh, from the, me and the makers of all the podcasts on our network, including the Bioshock Games Club that I was talking to Heather about, the monthly Call Me By Your Game co-op episodes, which we just released, the Mario Golf Toadstool Tour episode coming nice. up next month. I have a whole episode on Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. Uh, really excited. That's going to be a great group on that episode. I can't wait. But yeah. If you want to check out uh, what other stuff we have, if you can't get enough of this podcast, then uh, there's a way for you to support us and get bonus episodes every gosh darn week. But that'll do it for this episode of the Call Me By Your Game podcast. We will see you on the next one. Bye.